Lord. Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. But who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And what he do? And he's gonna react to all the self snitching. Oh. Hi, this is Bruce Rivers. Welcome to another edition of CLR uh, Criminal Lawyer Reacts. And today we're going to do a George Floyd trial update. That's what this whole episode is going to be about. So it's going to be a little bit long, but uh, I'm going to have some juicy information for you so you know how to kind of view the rest of the trial. Now, before we begin, first of all, I want to thank all of our followers. We're almost up to a quarter of a million followers in such a short period of time, and that is just absolutely amazing. Shout out to Michael Rivers because of Michael Rivers. We got this. We got our 100,000 uh, silver award. Thank you to Michael Rivers, the producer. Um, without him, none of this would be possible. So make sure you guys, to get uh, advance notice on things, uh, hook up with us on uh, Instagram, Twitter. And we finally got our second payment in on, on, on Patreon. So this week, I'll have an announcement about uh, getting our first guy out of jail, our first indigent defendant out of jail this week. So we're very excited about that. So let's dive right into the Chauvin uh, trial update, the George Floyd trial. Um, first of all, the prosecution in this case is represented by basically three main lawyers, Mr. Frank, Mr. Slisher, and Jerry Blackwell. Uh, all very, very fine lawyers in their own right. Now, what they've done in this case is they've grouped their witnesses into three separate baskets, basically. you got the fact witnesses. Those came out first. Those are the ones that had the heart-wrenching testimony that said what they saw. Then you had the use of force experts, including their own police chief. And that was really a critical piece to this because unless you can show that uh, Derek Chauvin violated some department policy going above and beyond what force would be necessary, you don't really have a crime. But they had uh, several use of force experts. They had the police chief, which is almost unheard of. You never see a police chief um, testify against their own. And then you had the medical testimony. You had the ER doctors that, uh, that treated George Floyd in the hospital. You had Lindsay Thomas, who is a medical examiner. She's a former employee of Hennepin County, and now she's private. And I can tell you this from personal experience. I know Lindsay, Dr. Lindsay Thomas very well. Um, I've hired her on a number of cases, and I consult with her on a regular basis, and she is as smart as a whip. And she is not a um, – she doesn't shape her testimony based upon who's paying her. She's not that kind of expert. Then we have Dr. Tobin. Dr. Tobin was a pulmonologist, and I'm going to explain his testimony in a little bit. Uh, but he uh, uh, was an Irish guy and uh, very, very impressive credentials, world-renowned pulmonologist. Why did they have a pulmonologist? Well, because there's some things that a medical examiner just can't testify to. They don't treat living patients. So they defer sometimes to the expertise of somebody else in another field. And in this case, that happened to be Dr. Tobin. And one of the things that the defense brought out uh, was that very fact that, you know, sometimes you have to rely on other experts for certain medical opinions. And then they had Dr. Baker, who was the medical examiner who actually did the autopsy. Everybody's testimony was fairly consistent. Everybody's testimony was uh, basically that it was the the combination of the drugs on board, the, the heart condition, and the neck compressions and, and the chest compression that killed uh, George Floyd. And then you couple that with the excessive force. It's a pretty compelling case. So the defend or the, the the prosecution ended last Friday with Dr. Baker. Dr. Baker is a Hennepin County medical examiner, the Hennepin County medical examiner. And next week they start up again. And I I don't know how many witnesses they have left. I have a copy of their witness list, but they finished pretty strong. And unless they have a cardiologist or somebody else uh, to testify, 
I think they're probably very, very close to being done. The next witnesses I would expect to testify would be those on George Floyd's behalf. We call those spark of life witnesses. Okay? So let's talk about Dr. Tobin's testimony. Now, it's been talked a lot about, about choking George Floyd. George Floyd did not die from being choked. George Floyd died from compression. So in order to survive, you need a certain amount of oxygen oxygen going into and out of your lungs. You need to have a certain amount of exchange, getting rid of the carbon dioxide, letting in the oxygen. Now, if you, let's say you work at a factory, okay, and you somehow uh, get wedged in between a press. So, so the press is pressing down on you. Your airway is not obstructed. You can st- there's nothing obstructing your airway, but the capacity in your lungs is restricted. So, in other words, you can only get uh, one milliliter or no, one liter instead of 1.4 liters of oxygen that you normally need uh, into your lungs. You're not going to die right away, but that deprivation of oxygen over time is going to kill you because you need a certain amount of oxygen to breathe, to to feed your brain, because your brain is super sensitive and that controls everything else. And the defense brought that up quite a bit, and they bought, but they brought it up in the context of uh, of the fentanyl on board. Now, Dr. Tobin testified about this, and it was that compression over nine minutes that caused that deprivation of oxygen. So, um, and, and the thing about it is, if you're a police officer, that you respond to these medicals all the time, and you know he's got fentanyl on board, you know what's going on with him. Uh, there's a couple of different things going on while this is going on. You've got uh, one of the officers saying, shouldn't we turn him over, right? you got another officer saying, I don't feel a pulse. He still doesn't get up. That's an issue. That is a, is a real issue. Uh, so it's a combination of these factors, but the substantial cause of death, as testified by all the state's witnesses, is the neck compression and the uh, compression on the back. Because uh, and because Chauvin had his knee on his neck and his knee on his back for that full nine minutes, and you know there was some something made of that there weren't any bruising. And when you have the compression like you do, that's over over a, a vast area. Um, you know when you have the knee and the and the shins on the neck and on the back, you would not necessarily expect to see any bruising. Um, In fact, it would be odd that you would see bruising. Now, so what is the defense going to do? The defense will probably start on Tuesday, I would guess, Uh, either late Monday or Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, depending upon how many more witnesses the the state has. But I I would bet that the state rests on Monday. You never want to rest your case on a Friday. Uh, that's just a general proposition. So I've had a chance to look at the state or the defense witnesses. I don't think that the there's going to be, again, a couple different buckets of witnesses for the defense. You're going to have a, a use of force expert, and they've only noted one, and that's going to be a Barry Broad, B-R-O-D-D. But then they've also noticed, uh, let's see, 25 doctors. I really doubt that they're going to call 25 doctors. But these doctors prepared a defense, and uh, you know, some of them are forensic pathologists. A forensic pathologist is a doctor who studies the dead, basically. And they are investigators of the cause of death. And so if somebody comes into their morgue and or their, you know, the coroner's office, and they, they do toxicology, they do uh, all kinds of different things. So, but they also rely on other types of experts. Now, 
there's a couple of different experts that I, I did notice on the defense witness list. One is an endocrinologist. That's somebody who studies diseases uh, like diabetes and, uh, and heart conditions, uh, but they're not a cardiologist. The other one is a forensic psychiatrist that the defense noted. Now, that's important because one of the, um, the third-degree murder, one of the charges, third-degree murder, requires the government to prove uh, depravity, okay, and in a depraved mind. In other words, uh, you're sitting there uh, and you have a really a gross indifference to human life. In other words, you're, you're just really so indifferent that it's depraved. Now, when somebody tells you that there is no heartbeat or there's no pulse, and you're still continuing to do what you're doing, one could argue that that's depraved because it's like who wouldn't you know render aid at that point? And even when the medic uh, when the medics got there, uh, Chauvin didn't get up off of him; he stayed on him, and that's that's an issue for for him, I think. But. So the forensic psychiatrist that the defense is going to call is somebody who will testify to that issue. There's other types of uh, medical experts that they have co- that they have on their witness list, like an ER doctor, uh, toxicologist, and uh, forensic pathologist, and those are all necessary. But one thing I I don't see on on here, I don't see two types of doctors, and that concerns me about the defense, only from a tactitional standpoint, not from a personal standpoint. Uh, I don't see a cardiologist, and I don't see a pulmonologist. Um, The state's expert was, I think he testified a little bit out of his expertise, but the defense didn't really object, so he was allowed to do it. Without a cardiologist or a forensic or, or a pulmonologist to testify that these drugs are really what caused his death. Um, I think it's going to be awfully difficult for the uh, defense to win this case. Now, so what? What's next? So the the state has to call the rest of their witnesses, which would be like two or three witnesses, I, I would bet. Unless, unless they go the rest of the week, I don't. They have a lot of. Each side has got a, a ton of witnesses on their witness list, but they don't. You don't always call every witness on your witness list. Um, and they finished really strong with some strong medical testimony on Friday with Dr. Baker. I doubt that they're going to have more medical testimony. They might, but you know, I, I'm not in their back pocket, so I don't know what their strategy is. So the def, the state will rest now. It'll be up to the defense at that point. They could. They could rest right there if they think that the government hasn't proved their case. Or they can present their own case, which is most certainly what they're going to do. And they will most certainly start with a use of force expert. And But they've only got one person to testify about that, and that's this Barry Broad. And then they'll go into their medical testimony and um, – I, I think that they're going to make a mis- – one of the things that they did on cross-examination with the state's forensic pathologist was they asked questions about – Eric Nelson asked questions, well, isn't it true that sometimes you have to rely on other experts? Or he would ask him a question and he'd say, well, I would defer to so-and-so because I don't treat living patients. And – if you don't have an answer for the questions you just asked, you know that'll stick in the jury's mind because they're taking copious notes, and it's really important that um, that you answer those questions that you just posed to the uh, to the other side. So he'll go into the use of force. He'll call some ac- uh, his own experts, and then you got to decide whether or not your client is going to testify. If you can avoid having your client testify, you generally do. In this case, I don't know how you have Chauvin testify um, because that would open the door to playing that video once again. And the more they play that video, 
uh, I mean, you don't want in this trial for the video to be the last thing that the jurors are going to see. But here's what's going to happen. So the state will have one final opportunity after the defense rests, and that's called a rebuttal. So, and they have to confine whatever witnesses that they bring at that point to the defense's case. So the state brings their case, the defense brings their case, and then the state gets a chance at rebuttal. And in rare circumstances, the defense can get what they call sir rebuttal. In other words, you bring, but it's all confined to just what the prior party brought. Um, you should look in that rebuttal argument for the state to play that video one last time. Um, I would bet all my money that, that they're going to do that because that's the last thing they want the jurors to see. That could backfire on them too because the jurors have already seen it a hundred times. You know, they know what's on that video. And if they think that the state is panicking and don't um, have the confidence in, in their case and that they're just doing this gratuitously, that could backfire on them. So now... I'm going to finish this with a comment. P some people say, uh, oh, Rivers wants, uh, you know, he he's a Fed. He wants, uh, or he he's racist because he wants uh, Chauvin to win. And No, I'm a defense lawyer. That's where, uh, that's where my bread and butter is in defense. Uh, on this case, however, I, I, I can tell you that I'm so glad that I don't represent Chauvin. But do we represent some people we don't want to represent? Sometimes we do. And Eric Nelson's done a much better job the second week than he did the first week. Um, he, I don't think he did well with, with the lay witnesses. Um, and he's, but he still got a lot of the science wrong. And um, I just you know, want a fair shake for everybody. Because for a prosecution to mean anything, uh, whether it's an acquittal or whether it's, uh, whether it's a conviction, it's got to be a meaningful process. It's got to be a fair process, fair for everybody. But I think my money is on the state on this case because, as I said before, there's a doctrine in law, it's a Latin phrase called res ipsa loquitur, which means that the thing speaks for itself. The fact that Derek Chauvin was on his back, on his back, not just on his neck, for nine minutes, a little over nine minutes, and wouldn't get off even when the medical personnel showed up in the ambulance. That speaks volumes about what this case is about. You got a white cop on, on the back of a black uh, man over $20. So the thing speaks for itself. So go ahead and, uh, and make some comments. I'll try, to, uh, I'll try to answer whatever questions you might have. It's probably easier if you send me something on Instagram because I can directly uh, DM you. But uh, I'll try to get to all the comments. Um, I have a lot of knowledge about this case just because I was on vacation last week. Uh, that's why I have such a beautiful tan now um, down in Florida. And, uh, and I watched a lot of the trial, and, and it was actually riveting um, watching it. And, you know, it, I watch it with a different perspective because I'm like, object, 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 or do this, or do that. Oh, why did you ask that fucking question, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, so it's kind of a sport for me in a sense. But, you know, these are people's lives that we're dealing with. And uh, it's really important that we remember that. This is uh, George Floyd's life. This is Derek Chauvin's life. And, um, and you know what? It's, this is a big, big case, and it's impacting a lot of people around the country. So um, be that as it may, it is important to know that, uh, that I've got your back. Uh, Go ahead and uh, send some comments to me. I'll answer whatever questions you have. And uh, so look for me on Instagram. That's probably the best place to DM me. All right. And then once again, check this out. This is a pride and joy. Thank you, Michael Rivers, for uh, all your hard work. And for uh, this is at 100000 Just wait. We're 25% we're there. We're almost, we're going to get to a million here shortly. So, um, so keep it up. And we'll talk to you next time on CLR Bruce Rivers.